Amen. All right, tonight and on Sunday evenings, we have, uh, for a few weeks now, been going through a series entitled The Biblical Family, and we are going to be resuming that this evening. Uh, tonight, particularly, the, the title of the sermon and the subject is Parenting, Dealing with Confrontation. And that is, again, Parenting, Dealing with Confrontation. So this evening, I'm going to be dealing with the subject of how to wisely handle problems in and problems with your family, pertaining to your family in any way at all. Uh, briefly, and first, I'll discuss the problems uh, within the sermon, that is, I'll discuss the problems within your own household and how to uh, deal with confrontation. So all these situations are going to deal with uh, more than one person. You know, obviously, it's a confrontation. There'll be more than one person. Sometimes those confrontations will take place within the home, as in it will involve only people within the home. But then also, and this is discussing parenting, so it's not on the subject of marriage or anything along those lines. It will be between children. But then also there will be confrontations from time to time that will take place of having to do with one child involving one party that is your child and then another party that is part of another family. So we're going to look at that as well, how to deal with those sort of confrontations, uh, how to prevent them, um, and so forth. So we'll go over uh, these subjects in detail. Uh, now, we're here in Luke chapter number 10, and the verse that I want to look at is going to be verse number 5. Verse number 5 uh, reads, And into whatsoever house ye enter, in this Luke chapter 10, verse 5, And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And a very simple principle that we've touched on a few different times I want to touch on right now uh, quickly, just remind you of that actually. I'm not going to go into this at all, but uh, that is that our house should be a place of peace. Right? There should be peace in our house. Uh, there are going to be confrontations from time to time. The thing is that you need to be able to deal with those confrontations. You need to know how to diffuse the, 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 the problem, diffuse the, the issue, and you need to know how to neutralize the confrontation. And not only that, you need to repair it. And, and be prepared going forward for it not to happen anymore. So we need to be, uh, uh, as parents, we need to be the peacemakers in the house, creating peace within our family. And especially the load and the burden would fall primarily on uh, the spiritual leader of the family, which would be the father. Okay, so we need to be peacemaker, peacemakers, excuse me, as parents, particularly the father needs to make sure that he is making peace in the home and leading his family uh, in that way. So first off, uh, I'm going to deal with confrontation within your family. Confrontation within your family. That's just two, the, two of the parties are your children. They're in your household. It would be two of your kids not getting along. Now, first of all, when dealing with confrontation, uh, the very first thing that needs to happen is you need to identify the problem. You need to identify and see what's going on. You need to figure out what's happening, what's going on in the household. Right? And, and that can come in a few different packages or in a few different stripes. It can look differently, and I'll explain what I mean by that, uh, about the few types of confrontations. Number one is that there can be an ongoing confrontation. Two kids that just don't get along in your house, right? There can also be kind of an immediate problem, you know? It's not something that's usually going on. These two kids don't typically fight. But how to deal with this particular situation when two kids aren't getting along, just in one situation. There's been some sort of fight, some sort of disagreement, and you, you, know, you are the one, obviously, that would have to fix it. Not necessarily a pattern, is what I'm saying. There's not necessarily a pattern of these two kids just not getting along. They don't have a past history or anything like that. So those are the two different types of confrontations that will be taking place in the household amongst your family and amongst your children that you're going to have to deal with. Those are the two basic types of confrontations. Ongoing confrontations between two children that just don't get along, or just maybe an immediate, one-time kind of offense type situation, right? If the problem, I'll deal with this first, if the problem is just here and now, right, it's the immediate, they don't have a past history, and two kids are fighting, the first thing that you need to deal with, and all of this is based on biblical principles that I'm teaching you, first thing you need to deal with is how big is the transgression, right? Because at number one, Every transgression does not deserve the same punishment. We can see that from God's law, and that's the same sort of way that should guide, the same sort of, uh, uh, what could you say, um, philosophy that should guide our discipline in our household. Yeah, it would be crazy to give just 
you know, five swats no matter what the transgression is. It doesn't matter. You punch your brother in the face, five swats. You know, you're slightly disrespectful to one of your brothers, five swats. That's silly, right? So there should be varying punishments, varying discipline, depending upon how big the transgression is. So when you're identifying the problem and it's just an immediate issue that took place, then the very first thing you need to do is identify, is this an ongoing issue? Is this something that has just occurred this one time? And then furthermore, the next thing is how big is the transgression? Now, one thing that you may not think about very often is this, and I'll bring this up again in the future. Sometimes if it's not that big of a transgression, you teach one kid to pass over the transgression. Use that as an opportunity to teach them the biblical principle that they're going to have to engage in later in adulthood. Mm -hmm. Right? I want to remind you, we're raising Christians. I want my kids to be Christians by the time they're, they're adults. They know how to live a Christian life. Mm -hmm. And they've already practiced these principles, and they already know what to do. When somebody offends them, and it's not that big of a deal, a me, my brother's done that a million times to me. I just pass over it. I know how to do it. I'm not deeply offended by it, or I just can't forgive it. So if it's not that big of a deal, you can teach one of the kids, hey, you know what you can do in this situation, buddy? I'm going to spank him for what he did, but you know what you can do in this situation next time? If it doesn't bother you that bad, it's not that big of a deal, just let it go. Just love your brother, just let it go. Forget about it. It's not that big of a deal. So use that as an opportunity, it's not that big of a transgression, to teach the one pass over the transgression. We bring that up to our kids a few times a month, right? Find these opportunities and look. You have to be intentional about parenting. You have to look for these opportunities or they'll never come to you. You have to be strategic and, and intentional about your parenting. Take it seriously is what that is. How big the transgression is, if, it's, if it falls under the category of they need to be disciplined, this is the next step, because what's going, what's going on here is you're deciding about how much time needs to be put into, and, and, and don't snicker about this, how much time needs to be put into the judiciary process. Now, whether you understand it or not, you are a real judge in your household, and it's your job to dish out the, the proper discipline, and you're held accountable for that from God. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. It's a serious thing. Right? You are the one that is the primary, you are the judge of your home fathers, and then when fathers aren't home, yeah, the mother is. And obviously, it's, it's a, you know, a, a co-participatory you know, participatory act with both involved as well, to some degree. Both are involved, even at the time of the transgression, to some degree. Both need to be disciplinary. So you need to figure out how big it is because that's going to tell you how much time you need to decide. You need, it's going to help you to decide how much time you need to determine what happens here. How much time am I going to have to put into this? You are the one that's responsible for discovering what happened. Two kids come to you. Is one of them going to say I'm guilty and the other says I'm innocent? No. How, who's ever had that happen? One time, ever? No. One, set, one says he, the other kid did it, and, and then you know what the other guy says? He did it. So you know what your job is? You're the judge, Really? You're the judge, and God wants you to be the judge, and God wants you to do a good job at this. You need to figure out who did what, and you need to right the wrong. That's your job. That is your job as a parent. That's what we need to be doing as parents. Okay? Your job is to determine who wrongs who and make it right. You know what you do? Don't laugh. You interview witnesses. Really? I do it. We do this all the time in our household. Every parent, I would say, engages in this to some degree. But you interview the witnesses. You know what? I get their testimony. You know? I pull out a notepad. No, I'm just kidding. I don't write down anything. I can, it's usually small enough where I can remember. And I can. And it's usually, usually you can figure it out pretty easily who did what. You look at what this person said. You look at what that person said. You know, I know. You know, We have a major advantage of being their parents. We see them every day. We know how they are. We know who does what. And when one person says something, I can tell that's totally out of character. Something's not right about what you just said. So that's a huge advantage we have as being parents, too. Okay? But your job is to right the wrong. You are the investigative agent. You are, you know, you're the judge. You do everything. You figure out and you interview witnesses. And another real principle that you need to apply in your household is if you don't have a real solid evidence, you know, a case, evidence-based case, you don't discipline your kids. If you're not positive that somebody did something, why well, just have a hunch? That's not right. You don't discipline somebody. Would you like our justice system to operate that way? No. And I'll tell you that's a quick way. 
speaking about embittering your kids, that's a quick way to make your kids real mad at you if you're disciplining them all the time. And, and you're wrong. Unrighteously or unjustly, they're being disciplined and they didn't do anything. Okay? So you need to have evidence. You need to know. But be, you need to be very sure that when you're disciplining your child that they're guilty for what they did. You need to figure out what happened. You need to take this job seriously. And one of the other biblical principles that we use in the mouth of two to three witnesses. Two or three witnesses, I'm sorry. My wife, I just heard her, like, I think it was two days ago, maybe yesterday. When I was in the other room, I heard her say, uh, uh, I couldn't hear the whole conversation until I heard, well, Michaela saw you too. That's two witnesses. Get over here. That's all that I heard. I don't know what happened. The next thing was, you know, I heard uh, uh, a rod hitting flesh a few minutes later. Right? So that's a good, that's a good application in, of that in your, in your life. Is, and you obviously interview witnesses, you know, and you can tell whether or not somebody's lying. You can usually tell. You get to know your kids, and you can see you're lying through your teeth. You would never say that where you're acting. You can just tell. You can, you can learn their demeanor. You can tell something's up. Something's not right with the story. So that's a big advantage that we have as parents. When it comes to you know being the judge of our kids, so that's an important part. So that, that's one of the ways that you need to, um, uh, or let's say some truths that you can use or virtues as parents uh, when it comes to dealing with confrontation. Never discipline your kids if you're if you're not sure um, what is going on. So you look at the evidence, you figure out what happened, you interview the witnesses, right? Never discipline your children without evidence. I'll repeat that one more time before I move on. If you aren't sure what, hap what, what happened in the situation as well as a follow-up to that, and it's a big deal, you know something you can do? Pray about it. You can pray about it. Like, this was really bad, and I want to figure out what happened here. So I'm going to pray about this for God to reveal it to me. And then, you know, you may feel as if, well, I don't know if that's going to work until two days later one of your kids walks over to you and confesses to it. You know, I believe that God answers prayers. If you want to keep your, if you're striving to do what's right, you're striving to walk you know, the way that God would have you to walk and to lead your family in the path that, that uh, God would have you to lead your family, he will answer that prayer. I believe that. I believe that he will answer that prayer. So pray to God if you can't figure out anything. Pray to him about the situation and say, hey, I'm not sure what happened here. If you want me to know about it, please just, Lord, reveal it to me in whatever way possible. So pray about that. Uh, I've heard somebody say that before, and that's a very good advice. Uh, also, if two kids are... Fighting over something, let's say a, a, a toy, for instance, or for example, it's, it's a toy, and you don't know who had it first. What a mess of one, right? So I can use that as an example. I had it first. No, I had it first, and you can't figure it out. There's just not enough information. You're not able to figure it out. Do you know what you do? What every good parent has done for many years? Nobody gets the toy. Exactly. Nobody gets the toy if I can't figure it out. It's not that big of a deal, right? There's tons of other toys to play with. Nobody gets the toy. If I can't figure it out, I'm not going to give it to him because I don't know if he had it first. And I don't know if he had it first. So it's okay. You know, there's a million other sticks out there that you can play with. They're fighting over something silly like sticks. You can go find another stick. Here, I'll break you in half. I know. You both got one, right? So you can, you know, you're the peacemaker. Don't you notice what's happening here is you are being the peacemaker in your household. It's a biblical principle. You're the judge. But what's your, your ultimate goal? You're a peacemaker. That's what we want in our house. We want our house to be a place of peace. Okay? How, you know, let's say you have an, an ongoing conflict now. Let's deal with that. An ongoing conflict between two children. This is a, this is a different type of problem. It would, fall, it would be a different category that would fall under. It's definitely, definitely looked at differently. Because now there's kind of a personal issue between two kids. And I've noticed, and you may see something differently, but I've noticed that typically when there's more of an age gap between the children, this is more prevalent. So usually the older kid and the younger kid are the ones that don't you typically get along as much. Brother Russell seems pretty enthusiastic, but that's correct. Now, right? If two kids are like right next to the same age, they usually don't fight as much. I've noticed that. Just, they fight. I'm not saying they don't fight at all. The kids, but they won't have like this ongoing duel thing that happens with like an older kid and a younger kid. And I've I've witnessed this in my family in in a few different cases. And I'll tell you some examples. Number one, I've seen this. With Michaela and Elijah, they have had this. And these have been extinguished for the most part. I've also seen this with Elijah and Jonathan. They've had these little ongoing duels. And I'm very confident that I have figured out where this comes from. Because when you look at 
the, the, the heart of the issue, when I find out what happened in each of these situations, and I line up all my evidence, right, and I, I try to compare each situation and see a common thread in what's happening, I'll say this, that it's, I believe that it falls under the category of disdaining the youth, of disdaining the youth. So uh, we have a tendency as humans, because we're sinful, to, uh, and this may be a little bit of a, 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 a pointed way to word this, but to pray on the weak. Okay? That's why God in the Old Testament warns about this over and over again. Not He's warning because it's a thing that happens. He's commanding to our weaknesses, things that we need to be warned about. Don't take advantage of the poor. Don't take advantage of the, of the widows. Don't take advantage of the fatherless. What's the, and the common thread between all those is what? They're weak. Why? Because people often take advantage of the weak. They look down upon the weak, don't they? You know, you see the debilitated old man, the elderly. When they get to a point where they're senile and stuff, how do a lot of people look at it? What's the human tendency? You kind of look down on them. You know, it's also a human tendency to look down on children. That's why Jesus commands against it. Right? You shouldn't look down on the children. And we have the, the uh, uh, warning that's given about pastors, and it's given about uh, uh, specifically to Timothy, from Paul, it says, let no man despise thy youth. Why? Because it's often and it's common that people despise other people's youth. And a lot of times, just to give you a heads up of what's going on in those situations, the elder sibling, that wicked sibling, right, is disdaining the youth of the, of the other sibling. What's happening? They're taking advantage of them in some way. They're looking down on them. That's, that's oftentimes what happens. And it becomes a vicious cycle. So it, it, that's like the root of it. But the other child obviously re responds because they're being mistreated. So you, once you're in the middle of it, it's hard to tell where the cycle began. But if you pay close attention, the commonality between all of these situations that I've noticed is the disdaining of the youth. Is the older mistreating or you know, taking advantage of the younger to some degree. And like I said, in our household, most this is, is by and large... Um, it's been extinguished. Um, you know, Elijah and, and Michaela, they don't fight near as much as they used to at all. That, that definitely. And then Elijah and Jonathan, and, and, and another thing that I've noticed is that they tend to, to, to another further proof is, is that the older will tend to gang up when they get the opportunity on the younger. Right? So I'll see Jeremiah sometimes getting on the side, and you know, they're, Jonathan's not capable of doing all the things that Elijah and Jeremiah can do, and they'll gang up on Jonathan. Right, uh, Johnny. So I'll I when I I I, I will uh, I'll point this out to Jessica. And the very first thing is going back to what I said. You need to identify what the root of the problem is. You need to figure out what's going on. If it's an ongoing issue. You need to figure out who's involved and what's actually happening happening when this goes on. Now, so you identify it, and obviously you take action, and. Number two is, you need, once you identify it, you need to be acutely aware of it going forward. You're acutely aware of it, and you and your wife are on full alert. And what needs to happen in this situation is, you and your wife need to correct it every time it happens. You need to extinguish it. That's what we did. Every time that you mistreat so and so, I've been watching it, and I'm seeing you treat them this way. Every single time, I hear you even slightly have an attitude with them, or mistreat them, or look down upon them, or speak disrespectful to them, I'm spanking you. So I'm giving you a warning now that I'm aware of how you're treating them, and you're going to be disciplined. Right? That sounded like I was speaking to one of my kids, the way that I just said it. So that's what we would tell our kids. So, And we would go ahead and tell them, too, hey, there's going to be five spots that are prescribed for this particular transgression every time going forward. So you better be especially kind to whoever it may be. Right? A lot of you need to be Especially kind of Elijah. All right? Uh, uh, there's, but that's not it. There's other steps because you're, 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 your goal is to be a peacemaker in the household. So there's other steps to this. When they wrong one another, we make them give each other a hug and a kiss. And we make them tell one another they're sorry. And especially if it's the, the transgressor. The one that's known. The common perpetrator, right? The, the, uh, the, the one that keeps committing the offenses. Okay? And we don't allow them to have a half butt apology, right? So, number one, we don't allow the apology to be half butt. 
Number two, so to, to kind of play this out, we make them look each other in the eyes. Like when I'm speaking to my kids, and, and, and uh, this is also another tip, when I'm speaking to my kids and I am disciplining them and, and especially, explain, ex, especially explaining to them, excuse me, what they have done wrong, I make them look me in the eyes. I don't allow them to kind of look around and stuff. I want them to take it seriously. I want to make sure that they're paying attention and that they're getting all of it. When, when that's being uh, 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 served out as well, they look each other in the eyes. And they're not going to have their head down to the side. They're not going to say it like they don't mean it. They look each other in the eyes. They give a sincere apology to the other. Okay? They give, you, they give a hug and they give a kiss on the cheek to the other person and then tell that person that they love them. Okay? That, this helps them work towards having a better relationship making them do this. And I can tell you that it 100% works. Furthermore, the last thing that we do is we teach them to love each other. Now, you should do this anyways, but we, we take a special step when we identify things like this in our household. We teach them to love that other person. And I'll tell you things that I particularly do. Uh, you know, as I said, most of the time, the heart of the issue, the heart of the problem, or that particular uh, uh, issue is going to be the older child. So I'll deal mostly with the older child. The root of the problem, I'll find out whoever it is, and I'll deal with that. And what I do is this. Uh, you say good things about the other child to, let's say, the older child. I, I've done this many times. Many, many times. Uh, for example, I would tell Elijah, hey, did you see, you know, did you see what Johnny did? Did you see how cool that was? Did you see how he just did that? That was actually pretty cool for his age. I'm surprised he was able to do that. Right? And you know what Elijah would say? Yeah, that is pretty cool. That was pretty cool. And it, and it slowly starts to look at his little brother in a different way. And I also say things to him every once in a while, like, hey, you know, Elijah, you know Johnny. Not in the midst of the moment, because here, I, I've said this before, and I don't want you to miss how important this is. When you're correcting your child, like 50% of what you're saying is getting through. Because the fences are up, if even that. So you need to, if you uh, uh, see an issue, take time when things are going well and speak to them about it. When things are great, right? When it's just you and your son, you're tossing football, right? And you just say to him, hey, you know, Johnny really looks up to you, buddy. You know, that's why you shouldn't fight with him. Johnny really loves you a lot, Elijah, right? And he thinks you're a really good big brother. So you need to, you need to make sure you treat him well. He really thinks a lot of you. Yeah, I'd say that everyone in here is wise enough, adult-wise, right, to uh, be aware that that makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. You know what I'm being? I'm being the peacemaker of my household. That's what I'm being. And my wife would do the same thing. And, and in other situations, these are particular things that, that I have done. I've actually said those almost exact things to Elijah before. Elijah's like, you're actually preaching about this. You, you did that a few weeks ago. That was longer than that, but... So um, what happens is you start, I'll start to soften, you know, one of the children's hearts towards the other one. And I would even tell Elijah, or I would tell Elijah something along the lines about Johnny. I would say, you know, Johnny thinks that you're the best, you know, biggest, you know, oldest big brother that he, that, that there is. Isn't that right, Johnny? And then Johnny would say, yeah, that's right. And how do you think Elijah feels about that? He's like, that's pretty cool. That's right. That's right. That's exactly how he feels. You know what he thinks? You're all right, Johnny. <laughs> That's what he thinks. That's what he's thinking when you say things like that to him. So later when he thinks about picking on him, he's going to be like, nah, never mind. Really? I mean, I'm, it's funny, but I'm serious. This makes a difference in the way in which your children treat one another. Just yesterday I was telling Jessica how there's been a huge improvement. Elijah's making Johnny toast. Johnny's standing there next to him while this is while Jessica was gone. Johnny's standing there right next to Elijah and he's telling him, I love you. You're such a good big brother. A lot of the things that I told Johnny about, Elijah. Isn't that fun? And Elijah's like, hey, Johnny, come sit down next to me. You know what I did? I taught him how to treat one. I taught both of them how to treat each other. So the teaching, you know, more so than the discipline, this is so important. The teaching them actually how to be and what to be is more important than spanking them. It's more important. The example and the things that you're training them to do, hey, it's harder. Yeah, that's why nobody does it. Because it's a lot easier to tell your kid to get over here and bend over and spank them twice than it is to take time out of your day to think about these things, to identify the problems, and then to, to try a million things until you figure out what works. Right? 
You know, that, you know, that's, it's a lot more difficult to do that. But you know what? It's what's more beneficial. It's what's much more uh, uh, effective. We need to be the best parents that we can be. Okay? We need to be the peacemakers of our household. So when there's confrontations amongst the children that are in our households, it's your job to fix that. I want my children to love each other when they grow up. I don't want them to have bad relationships and then carry that on into adulthood. I want them to love each other, and I want them to care about each other. And uh, that starts in the household when they're young. Okay? <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, verse number 9. <coughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse number 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So if you have, the next thing I'll, I'll deal with real quick is that if you, if you have one child that is just very divisive in, in the family, then you need to focus more of your efforts on that particular child. You need to figure that out, identify it, see what the problem is, and then you need to uh, figure that. So if there's one child that just fights with everybody, right? And it's clear not just, you know, it's not it's not two people that are involved, you know, every time that they just kind of have a thing. I mean, they're they're involved in a cycle. Even if one of them started it, they have their own little cycle between each other. So the, the big picks on the little from time to time, and the little now has a chip on his shoulder when it comes to that person, and they just constantly are fighting. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about one child that's just very divisive in the household. Just constantly getting in fights with each and every child, and they're kind of the root of the problem, just being divisive in general. What you need to do is you need to focus your efforts on that child. Okay? And if you have, let's say, many other children that are very well behaved, it would be wise to sacrifice a little bit of time away from the mother, those other children. If you have a, a bigger problem with one kid, you need to focus your efforts on that kid. You only have so much time, is what I'm saying. I would rather, if I have one kid that's just a big problem in my family, right? I would rather sacrifice time with the other kids or, you know, maybe you got two of them. Well, however this works, as long as they're not the ones fighting with each other, but these kids are just kind of just in inherently divisive, right? Because some kids can develop that, okay? I would sacrifice time with the very well-behaved and I would be fine with him getting away with a couple of things that he wouldn't usually get away with just so long as I could focus, you know, much more of my time towards this one kid that has a bigger problem. Isn't that kind of common sense? Because this is a bigger issue, and I want to spend a lot more time on this issue, and this other kid is already pretty well behaved, and yeah, kids are going to be kids, and he's probably going to get away with a couple of more things. Maybe not even, but he might get away with a few more things just because I'm going to be just trying my best with this one child. Okay? That's, that's what you need to do. And what you'll realize real quickly is that your house will be, if it is one child that's causing a lot of the divisiveness, okay, you'll realize that when that child starts to improve, the whole household changes. The entire house is changing because it's, you're getting to the root of the problem of the whole house. All right, so you need to identify, is that the other type of issue? Maybe it's one child, right? And remember, sometimes the reason why a child can be mishaving, be mishaving, goodness sakes, uh, is because their tank isn't full, right? Their tank can not be full sometimes. They could not be getting either love, the love, it, their needs cannot be, you know, maybe not, may not be uh, uh, met fully in the area of love and respect. Okay? That can be a possibility in that. And they may have another problem too, but that could be, it could be multifactored. There could be a few things that are going on there. You need to make sure you're, that that's not a part of it. You might get rid of 50% of it because they just want more attention. They feel like they're kind of being neglected, or whatever it may be. Give them that attention, 50% of it's gone, and then, yeah, they develop this little problem over here, being divisive, and you deal with that. And what you do is you know what their problems are. You know what, they, what they're inclined to do. And every time they do it, you discipline them. That's what you have to do. You have to be very consistent with it. You find out what that child does, and you tell them, and, and this is something that's very important. You let them know that you're aware of it, obviously lovingly, don't be a jerk to them, but you sit them down and say, hey buddy, I know that you do this, and I'm going to help you because I love you, and we're going to fix this problem. Every single time that you do this, I'm going to spank you. If I ever see you do it, you're getting spanked. Now, did that sound hateful or mean or anything? It sounded loving but stern, right? Did you think I was kidding when I said it? I was serious, right? Any child would be like, okay, he's not joking. 
I'm going to get spanked, right? If I do that. You can do the same thing. I practice in the mirror, you can do, right? So just stern but loving. You need to, there needs to be both, right? Stern but loving. Every single time you do that, you're getting spanked. I'm doing it because I love you. I don't want you to grow up and think that you can do it every How do you want to describe it, right? I want, I want you to be a good kid. That's why. So I'm going to spank you every single time. So they need a warning and they need to know ahead of time that you're getting ready to start cracking down. But let me say this as well. So you make them aware. Number two is this. If you're getting ready to step up your discipline on this child, you need to proportionately step up the affection that you give the child. So you don't just start spanking this child 75% more than what you were spanking them, but then not confirm your love equally. So however much you discipline a child, you need to equally make sure that you are confirming your love to the child. One way, as I've said before, that I do this is once I, when I discipline a child, I at that moment tell them that I love them. I, and I even ask them the question, and I think I did this at one other time with one of my kids as an example. I ask them the question, and they can answer it back because they know what to say because I've taught them this. Why does daddy, why are you getting in trouble? Why is daddy spanking you? And then the answer is because you love me, right? So I make sure that they understand that the reason why you're getting the spanking is because I love them. Because kids don't fully comprehend that. They know that there's been a break here and there needs to be reconciliation. It's a, you're dealing with um, a transgression, right? A problem. Just like your relationship with God, when you sin against him, there needs to be a, a, a moment of reconciliation after that. So that I deal with that moment after disciplining them. I'm the father. They're the son, just like God the father. And I'm his son. If I sin against him, I need the moment of reconciliation. He can punish me, but I need it to be reconciled. I feel like there's a schism in the relationship. Your child feels the same way. Your child feels the same way. So when you discipline them, you need to afterwards confirm your love to them. Tell them, I love you, and that's why I'm saying and I always like to tell my kids, you're completely forgiven. That's another thing I like to say to my kids. You're totally and completely forgiven. It's, and I would strongly recommend these things, especially if you're getting ready to, uh, or maybe in the future you have a child that's kind of just becoming more of a problem, or they're being more divisive, or they're just being bad. You want to put an end to something that they're doing. You tell them that. You st you're obviously going to have to step up the spankings. Hopefully the warning works. You step up the spankings, but then also you make sure that you are affectionate and loving to that child as well. It's good to let them understand that they're completely forgiven. That's a big deal. That you're not holding it against them, that they're completely forgiven. And if you feel like a kid kind of is embittered towards you when you spank them and they act that way, number one, that's a big sign that their tank's not full, number one. Number two, that's that's also a, a, a way in which they, I'm saying it in this, con in this context because that's usually... A way in which they tell you that they don't feel forgiven. They feel like there's something still there that's not fixed. So you know what you do? After you tell them, you tell them beforehand, when you're explaining to them and reproving them for what they did, make sure they understand why they're being spanked, you spank them, you confirm your love, you give them a hug and a kiss, you tell them they're completely forgiven, and then you know what you would do? What you do? You're the parents, so you need to do these things. Hey, buddy, you want to go play some football? Do you know what that tells them? I totally forgot about it. Hey, you know, and you're like, well, my kid doesn't like to play football. Then what do they like to do? Say that. Right? Tell them that. If they're super bitter, you know the thing that they want to do even, even when they're mad. That's what you say to them. If they're having trouble with getting over the discipline because maybe they maybe their tank isn't all the way full. Maybe they, maybe they have been kind of neglected in an area for whatever reason that may be. It happens, you know, parents, not purposely, maybe it's just slightly and you're busy, whatever it may be. This is the way to deal with that at the time while you're kind of getting the kid out of it. You may not have to do that in the future when everything levels off and they feel like they understand you love them and they feel like everything's good. But if the child feels, you know, uh, um, however you want to word it, right? If the, if the child feels embittered towards you for whatever reason, that's a great way to let them know, hey, I love you and everything's over. You want to go do this. You want to go play that game. You want to go do that. That's a really good tip to use to get that point across. <clears throat> so that really covers most of what I wanted as far as what's important to deal with in the household. There was some general tips that was given that were given there as well. 
uh, to deal with confrontation in the household. And some of those will kind of overlap with what we're going to talk about right now when dealing with your children. But the next half of the sermon I want to deal with confrontations with other families regarding children. Now this can be an uncomfortable subject, <clears throat> excuse me, to talk about, right? Because this is uh, this is a, 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 it's a very the reason why it's because it's an extremely sensitive subject. It's an extremely sensitive subject. Now the most important thing to start off with is, I, and, I've, and I mention this all the time because it is truly the most important thing. Suspense for a moment there. The most important thing, excuse me, is biases. Dealing with your own biases, okay? Everyone has a bias. Everyone has a bias. Every single person has a bias. All of us do. And if you think, if you're the person that says, I'm not biased, I'm, I have no bias, my judgment is totally, you know, just and right, you are the person that is more apt than anyone to be behaving in a prejudiced, unfair manner. Because when, you, when you're not aware of your biases, that's when it's extremely dangerous. That's when it's extremely dangerous, when a person doesn't think that they're biased. So step one is to identify and acknowledge your bias, that you have a bias for your own kids. Everybody does. Step two is to operate with your bias in mind. To operate in situations with a confrontation with your bias in mind. So that is to say, be mindful of your bias when making a decision. Take it into excuse me, account. You need to take your bias into account in the situation. Okay? Uh, it is possible to have a bias, but to still function in an unbiased manner. And the only way that that's going to happen is if you are aware of your bias and you're careful not to allow your bias to skew your judgment. Okay? So, you're going to have a bias. You, know, you need to understand that right away. In this situation. So that's the introductory remarks to what we're getting into right now. Confrontations with other families, confrontations with other people's children. When one of your children's involved, and then another child from another family. You know, what's the what's the, the cliche that every parent, you know, says? The, the cliche remarks. My, they, child's my child's an angel. My child would never do that. Now your child might, but my kid would never do that. There it's funny because there's if there's truth there. That's what that's you know that's what comedians figured out. Things that are funny have truth to it. It's not it has no truth to it. It's not funny. So <clears throat> there's truth behind that. So understand that you're that you are biased towards your children. You need to understand that everyone is okay. Now the other thing that I want to deal with it, 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 the first part of this because it's so closely connected is the last thing that I talked about in the last category is if there's a child that's a problem child or just a, pro, a, 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 a problem in general. That, or it could even be, it doesn't even have to be a problem child. It could be a, a, a child that maybe your child doesn't get along with, okay? Right, just a child that you just kind of see things going on often with, or maybe also on top of that, your child doesn't get along with. Because these things happen, right? You know, just like two particular kids, for whatever reason, may not get along with the family, you might have two kids from two different families that don't get along. along. Or it could be that this child is a problem child or a divisive child. That's also possible. They exist. Okay, this might be, it could be at church. It could be at any sort of place you visit often. Maybe you go to, uh, um, what, what are those things? I think you guys did. Co-op. Yeah, you know, we don't particularly do co-op, but some people go to co-op and their kids are around a lot of other kids. And I'm sure there are, when you get around a lot more of them, you're definitely going to find problem kids. And you're going to know who they are and how they act and what they do. And there's certain ways that we need to approach those situations as Christians and as parents. Okay, Because you get yourself in a lot of trouble when dealing with confrontations with children. You, have a, you can cause a lot of problems in your life with that. Number one is you don't disdain the child. You never disdain the child. You never look down upon or just dislike somebody else's kid. And I'm going to get into what's so bad about that. Number one, he's a, he's a child, for crying out loud. He's a kid, and you're an adult. And that's particularly what I'll get into in just a minute. That's not justifying the bad behavior that the child has. Okay? But it's being responsible. But it is being is responsible and balanced. He's a child. He's not an adult. You shouldn't expect him to be an adult. It's more expected that a child would misbehave than an adult. Okay, this is, foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. You need to understand that. All right. It, obviously, the older the child is, uh, the less excusable the behavior is. 
But first, let's acknowledge that we're talking about children. We're not talking about adults. We're talking about kids here. Right? Number two, you don't gossip about other people's children. That's huge. You do not gossip about other people's kids, ever. Right? Multiple reasons why. When there, especially when there's gossiping going on about other people's kids, almost every time, it's within your bias. Right? You know, if somebody's gossiping, if, if, a, if a father and a mother are gossiping about another, pe another person's child, you can almost guarantee that 75% of it is geared towards a bias. Almost every single time. Okay? Anytime one of my kids on the ride home or at the table or really in any situation tries to come to me and attempts to tell me about what whatever child did, I shut it down immediately. I do not allow it. It does not happen in my house. I do not allow that to happen because I'm a mature adult. And what parents are doing when they begin to engage in the gossiping of other people's children, you're acting like a child now is what you're doing. Because it makes you feel better to talk about the other kids. It, that's really what it is. That's why people gossip in general. That's why people gossip about other people in general. That's their way of, it's called backbiting. That's their way of biting that person or saying something bad about that person when that person's not around. And it usually comes from, it can, not always, come from envy and bitterness. It can sometimes be a bad kid that you're talking about. That, that happens too, right? The could, kid could be bad. And the kid might have done something wrong, but you know what? It's still gossip. You have no reason to talk about it. There's no reason to talk about other people's kids and how they behave. That's not right. That's not okay. And that's not something that I allow in my household. And as your pastor to give you advice, it's not something that you should allow in your household either. That's not all right. You obviously wouldn't allow someone in your household to gossip about another adult. Why would it be okay to gossip about a kid? What's the difference? That's not all right. If a kid's a problem child, okay, he is. That's not your child. There's no reason to talk about it. Now, here's the only time that I would say that you could talk about it. If a child comes to me, and I've already instructed my kids about this, they're well aware of this and they know this, I tell them, do not come to me unless it's a very serious situation. Unless you think that somebody's in trouble or they're doing something that's very bad that, they, that they, their parents need to be informed about. It. And they know this. This is a clear thing because every three to two months, a kid tries to come and say something about what so-and-so did, and I remind them. Okay. Just the only time when you should be that should be happening when a child comes to a parent is when it's a serious situation where so and so needs to be informed, you know, whoever that parent may be that they have done this, or maybe my kid has been exposed to something and I want to know about it. If they are knowing that they said this or they did this or they saw that or whatever it may be, did my kid and I want to know something about it. So that's the only time when my kids are allowed to bring something up that another child has done that they were exposed to. That's it. And, 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 and I'll kind of inquire in the beginning, and if I can figure out that it's not worthy to speak about, because I don't want a dangerous situation to slip by either. So I, may, I give that caveat, and you should as well. But if it's just something that kids do, and one kid is just being a stinker to another child, Shut up. Shut your mouth. We don't talk about other people here. Right? You know what I'm doing? I'm teaching them to be Christians. Because I'm not going to let them gossip when they're young and they're a child, and I don't want them gossiping when they get older. All right? I'm teaching them to be Christians. Everything that I'm saying, I'm not using a ton of Bible, but I'm teaching you biblical principles all throughout this and how to raise your family, how to raise your kids particularly. Okay? Um... So in that case, obviously, it wouldn't be gossiping. And, and, and the only time that you should ever talk about another, you know, another kid with another, with let's say, your spouse, is if you guys are discussing like, hey, I'm going to go and talk to that, you know, their their parent, because I think that I don't think they're aware of it, and I think it's it's getting them to be a bigger deal. You know, and you really love them, and it's the same. You know, it's the same principle. That is applicable with you gossiping, with, with, with us not gossiping about adult other adults. The only time you talk about it is if you are maybe getting counsel and saying, hey, you know, I'm gonna I'm planning on going and talking to this person. And maybe the wife is asking the husband, what do you think about it? Or maybe she's telling him, I would rather you talk to the father. That's the only time you guys should ever speak about that. And if you do, 
You shouldn't be doing it when your kids are around. Okay? Remember that just because you're under four foot doesn't mean you're deaf. Do everybody get what I'm saying? It's because people are short because they're kids. They hear you. Who remembers things from when they're like nine and ten years old? People saying things. Yeah, that's like four years ago. Of course you believe that. Or you remember that. All right? Yeah, everyone here does. I can remember hearing people say things about other people when I was young. I'm sure everybody here, if they, if they really wanted to, they did. And I'm sure that you did, whether you remember it or not, you heard people gossip about stuff. And you heard your parents talk about people you shouldn't have been talking about. Your kids hear that. That's not good. You're poisoning their, their, their ears and their minds, and you're giving them a bad example. So that should not happen. You shouldn't be gossiping about other people. Unless it's a serious situation, you and your wife are having a discussion about what happened, and you just want to make sure that, hey, is it a good idea that I go and speak to so-and-so? Maybe your wife wants to, to speak to the mother because she's more involved, and maybe it was a daughter that did. Right? There's girls that are involved, and you're thinking, you know, they're thinking, oh, they're talking about me. We're only girls here, right? Maybe that's the case. Maybe that would be better instead of the fathers because of what the nature of the thing is, right? Okay? So that's the only time you should ever be talking about another kid. Even if the child is a problem child, it shouldn't be happening. It should not be going on. You don't gossip about other people's children. How would you feel if somebody's gossiping about, and here's the golden rule, how would you feel about if, if another parent, if other parents were gossiping about your child, speaking bad about your children, how would that make you feel? You'd be, it would bother you. Whether you admit to it or not, it would make you angry. It would bother you if other people were speaking badly and saying bad things about your kids. That's a direct reflection on you as a person. So it's not good. Uh, shouldn't gossip about anyone, even children. Number three, don't bring it up to the parents all the time, and definitely, uh, or don't bring it up to the parents, and definitely not regularly. Okay, don't bring it up to the, the parents, and definitely not regularly. Don't be constantly telling other other parents, and you'd be surprised, you know, that their kid is misbehaving, that their kid shouldn't be doing that, that they don't think that their kid should do that. You know, there are a, a whole lot of you know, people out there, Karens is what I was going to say. That's an effective term. I'm glad somebody coined that. That's an effective term. There are a lot of Karens out there. I'm sure you've met them and you know what they're like. But they're just constantly, to your face, saying something, maybe even about your kids. But they might be that their kids are worse behaving. And I, I don't let my kids do that. Or I wouldn't do that. So Johnny, every time I see him do that, Johnny's actually one of my kids. Johnny is, is a, one of the uh, 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 typical names that you would use, the common names. But I wouldn't let, you know, Bob, or I wouldn't let John do that. Every time I see Bob, he's doing that. Don't do that. Do not remind a parent, even if the child is a problem child. It doesn't have to be that, but don't do that. Okay? Unless you are lovingly going to them to tell them, hey, I think you got a problem here. And I'm only telling you, obviously, be discerning. I'm not wording it that way for you to use as a template. Please understand that. You know, you got a problem here while John's standing there, right? You know, you wisely, and I'm actually going to get into how to word some of these things in a moment, is why that matters. You wisely, discerningly, carefully, very carefully thought out, prepare yourself, and then go to them lovingly, and make sure you're going to them for the right reason. To, to tell them, hey, I think this kid is getting involved in something, he's getting influenced, whatever it may be, right? They keep saying this, I don't know where it's coming from, maybe they're saying it, I don't know what it is, but hey, I'm worried about your kid. I love you, and, and, they, and it may not be what you think it is. It might, you know, you never know these kind of situations, it might get straightened out, right? Well, they said that because of this, and we've already dealt with it, whatever it may be, right? We're dealing with that, and we identify it. Thank you very much, brother. Just make sure that, that they're aware that, hey, I love you, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about what's going on. Okay? When you do those things, this is the very next thing I'm hitting on now. I couldn't remember the exact order. When you go to another parent, let me give you some, a couple of general advice points on this. When you go to another parent about children, understand this is a very sensitive subject. It's an extremely sensitive subject for all parents involved. Okay? So you need to, as I said, it needs to be thoroughly thought out. It needs to be very carefully thought out. It needs to be, you need to be very discerning with your words, right? And you know what? Some parents might not, 
you know, they might, it may not be as sensitive for them because they're wiser, they're more mature, and it doesn't bother them that much. They may be like, you know, okay, I appreciate your advice. So they just kind of, you know, I'm gonna, I'll look into that. But a lot of times, and especially when the mother is involved, especially when the mother is involved, this is a very sensitive subject, an extremely sensitive subject when it comes to children, because mothers are more attached to the children. It's their primary job. It's what they're primarily responsible for. And when you offend their children, you're offending them. So especially if two mothers are going to be talking. Dads can blow off a lot. But if you plan on talking to another mother about what some child did, their child particularly, it needs to be very thought out. It needs to be very discerning and make sure that you're coming from the right place. Make sure that it's Love is the reason why you're visiting them. You're wanting to talk to them about that. This is another thing that I hit on. I said I'm going to kind of touch on the, the, this subject further in a moment. This is another general advice point. When dealing with other parents' children, this is general advice, okay, across the board, you are the adult. You are the adult. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that. See, children are expected to be immature. And children are expected to treat each other disrespectfully, and particularly, they're expected because they're foolish. Now, that doesn't mean that it's justified, but children are vengeful. And we've all seen this before, and you know, the Karen, you can use that again. The Karen, it's embarrassing when that type of parent, or when parents in general, are trying to avenge their own children. Everyone knows what I'm talking about, right? And then they begin to mistreat another child, or to try one child does something to their child, and then they want to get back at the other child. That's embarrassing. It really is. That's very embarrassing. And, and, and maybe you felt this way in your heart before, too. And understand that that is wrong. That's a child. These are children. You're an adult. If, 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 if a child does something to your child, you're an adult. Don't be a kid like them, right? Don't, don't be a child like them. We get angry at a kid. They're children. That are, that, that, are, that are fighting here. A lot of times it can be four, five, six, seven, eight years old. And you see the, 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 the and, and like I said, you know, obviously men have their flaws and faults and women have theirs. More often than not, it's the mother that does this more than the father. Because men are kind of, that kind of stuff, they're more hands off, right? Where a mother, if, they're, if, a, if a child does something to their kid, especially if they do it to their kid, they wouldn't care as much if it was to somebody else's kid. Showing that you're being a respectful person, so you're not being just. If a child does something to their kid, they're just like bitter towards the kid. And they just have this grudge towards the child. And that's immature. Now you, you know, that's why the title of this point was, you are the adult. You need to be mature. You need to be the one that's mature. I mean, if we don't have a parent in the house that can deal with two kids fighting, who in the world can what you're doing is you're stooping to their level. You're acting like a child is the point that I'm making. Just like them. You need to be the adult. And what that means is this. You need to be mature. You need to be responsible. You need to be composed. Right? Keeping your composure, your temperament needs to be composed. You need not be angry and things like that. And then most importantly, you need to be unbiased. I understand that that's it. very difficult. It can be challenging. Right? You need to be unbiased when it comes to these things. Because you know the reason why you're mad? Because it's your kid. It's not justice. And it's not righteousness. It's because it's your child. And if you flip the script and that was your kid, you'd be mad at your kid. Your present child. It's yours. Right? So it's nothing to do with justice. It's only because it's your kid. That is being a respecter of persons. And as parents, we're going to have to judge matters like this. Okay? We're going to have to judge situations like this. One of the biggest things that's brought about judges over and over again is that they need to not be a respecter of persons. That's one of the worst things when it comes to being a judge, is being a respecter of persons. Okay? So, parents, in these situations, we must be the adults. That is to say we need to be mature, we need to be composed, we need to be responsible, and we need to be unbiased. Okay? This is how we deal with these sorts of situations. Now, how to right wrongs with other families is going to be similar steps when it comes to what we discussed earlier, righting wrongs in your own household. Number one is your kid can suffer loss. So I want my kid to suffer loss. Visit the last point that I just talked about. Your child needs to learn how to be a Christian. 
You know, when you let your kids suffer loss, I teach my kid to do that with your children and with all children that they come in contact with. You know, I, in my life, attempt and do, at times, suffer loss with other people. Per on purpose and intentionally. Somebody says something I don't want, or don't like, somebody does something that I don't like, I just suffer loss. I just don't say anything back. I just let them say whatever they said. You know, this is what Christians do. Act like a Christian. So you know what? You need to teach your kid to act like a Christian with other kids do. Right? You know, the reason why a, a parent wouldn't like that, like I said, this is a sensitive, to touchy subject. Because we love our children so much, we can obviously not want another child to get the better of our child. But that's what suffering loss is. That's what it is. Okay? That's what suffering loss is. Now, obviously it needs to be guided by the same principle that I spoke of earlier. Is it a big enough transgression? Or is it a small enough transgression, I should say, that you can pass over, that you can suffer loss? But there's times and situations where I obviously need to talk to the other parent. Where the other parent needs to know. But I teach my kids, if you're able to just let it go, let it go. Well, I don't want my kid, your kids to get the best of my kids, or so-and-so's kids to get the best of my kids. Teach your kids to be a Christian. Teach your kids to be a Christian. And how great would it be if every kid in here was taught that? If all of them suffered loss. See how that causes you to not be biased all of a sudden? So you're only wanting to be biased when you felt like your kid was getting one, you know, somebody got one over on them. But when everybody's kid's doing that, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, it's all right. That's your bias. That's not righteousness. It's not justice. And it's real easy for us as parents to be biased. I hope that if you didn't think you were biased, I hope that this is helping you realize that I am biased, actually. You're right. That is what I just thought. Okay? Teach your kids to suffer loss. Don't you want them to do that when they're uh, an adult? Well, they need to be taught that now. Teach them in the household. Teach them with other kids. If it's not that big of a deal, just let it go. Amen. Okay? Um, if your child hurts another child, okay? If they hurt another child, or they violate another child in some way, obviously I mean in the sense of harming them or saying something that bothers them, and, and it's deserving of, the, of discipline, discipline them. If your child hurts another child and, and it's deserving of discipline, discipline them. Discipline them. Okay? The reason why is because it's offensive to the other parent. It is. It's offensive to the other parent when you don't discipline your child and and he just did or she just did something that was worthy of discipline to this other kid. It is. Okay? Everyone in here knows. It's the same thing. Of, it's just righting wrongs. Okay? It's righting wrongs. You know, uh, uh, when someone, let's say, if, if someone, for example, were to hurt, and it's easy when you talk about somebody in your family, were to hurt your mother. Right? Let's think of the most vulnerable person in your life, right? It's all about sensitive. Were to hurt your mother, okay, you'd want that person to be caught and judged righteously, wouldn't you? Right. How do you think they feel about when your kid disrespected their kid or did something deserving of discipline and you're just like that? Ah. It's like a smack in the, face, in the face to the other parent. Because here's, let me, let me display your, expose your bias to you again. When the reverse takes place and their kid does it to your kid, all of a sudden what do you want to happen? It'd bother you if they didn't discipline their kid, wouldn't it? If your kid just hurt or harmed another kid or did something that they shouldn't have done that was very hurtful to your child, your kid's crying, it's a big deal, what do you want? You want righteousness, right? You want justice to be served, and that makes you feel better about the situation because it's not just going to continue and, hey, this was settled. Put your bias aside and do that same thing to your kid. Do you know what a way, an effective way to help us to understand this is? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Remember this morning I talked about how tremendously effective that is to help you to understand how you should treat other people. Ask that yourself that question when you're in a situation. When you're about to do something to someone else or not do something to someone else, that's a good, we call it the litmus test, right? It's a good test to use. What, I, what I'm getting ready to say to them, if you're being diligent about it, would I like somebody to do that to me? Well, maybe I should word it in this way just to be safe. Okay? You want people to discipline their children when they wrong your child. You do the same. You do the same. 
You punish your kids or discipline your kids when they wrong other people's kids. It's offensive to the parent when their kid hurt your kid or did whatever to your kid. Hurt them in whatever way. And then you just don't do anything about it. Okay, so um, all these things are here. These help for strong relationships within our church community. Within the church. These are how to have strong relationships and how for you to, to eliminate problems with other people. And to, 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 to judge righteously and to live righteously and do, to do what's wise and discerning, right? Okay, um, next point that I want to get on. I don't have the rest of this as organized as I would like. It's kind of just blocks of text. I have to kind of sift through this. Don't go around uh, correcting other people's children. Kind of the same thing that I was getting on before, right? Don't go around correcting and, and, and telling other people's kids not to do things. Right? This, this is a way to eliminate problems. Okay? It's not necessarily dealing with the confrontation, but what you're doing is you're, you're, you're eliminating the, the, the potential of, excuse me, of the problem. Unless you have the authority in that particular area or in that particular locality. Okay? Uh, so, correcting is different than, let's say, warning a child if he's in danger. All right? Because everybody obviously understands the difference in these situations. There's a difference in a child doing something that you don't approve of when you're not their parent and you telling them not to do that. Mm -hmm. And then a child playing in the road right. and you telling them, hey, buddy, you need to come over here. You need to get out of the road. Those are two way totally different things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just for the sake of relationships and things like that, it is not good to walk around and correcting other people's kids. Flip it around again. Ask yourself the question just to further... Understand this. How do you feel? Everybody knows the Karens. I can think of a particular woman in the church that I used to go to that, that would go around just correcting everybody's kids and telling other people's kids not to do this and not to do that. Do you like that when people do that? Or is that irritating? It's annoying. You don't do it to other people's kids. If you don't want same thing. If you don't want people doing it to you, how do you think they feel? Don't go around telling other people's kids not to do this and not to do that. Let their parents deal with it. Now, in tandem with that, and I'm going to give you a quick point, and you should teach your kids the same exact thing. My kids are instructed not to just obey anything and everything that a parent tells them to do. You know why? Number one, I don't know if I approve of what you're going to tell them. Number one, we may have different rules in our household. That's another reason why you shouldn't do it. But I don't know what you're telling them to do. And I don't want them to obey you. I don't want you to tell them that you possibly be telling them to get in the back of a van. I don't want my kids just randomly obeying any adult. That's not biblical either. This falls under the same category of wives obeying their husbands. Do you know who kids should obey? Their parents. Do you know who wives should obey? Their husbands. My kids have been instructed not to obey other parents. All right? Now, Obviously, there are caveats to that. If my kids know not to be doing something, and somebody happens to say, hey, buddy, you shouldn't be doing that, they're going to stop doing it because they know they should be doing it. Right? They already have been aware of it. Why do they know? Because you said it or because I said it? Because I have told them as their parent, don't do that. You shouldn't do that. Now, you can honor your elders, and they can honor, they can have honor and respect to elders and those that are older, they can respect everyone in here without obeying them. You want to give me an example? I honor the elderly. I honor people that are older than me. But do I obey everything that they do? Uh, they say to me, I'm sorry? And would I obey anything and everything that they told me to do? No. It depends on if that's a part of the honor that someone deserves and gets. It might be in some situations, but sometimes it may not be. You can honor the hoary head, you can treat them especially respectful and come to them first and give them a certain type of reverence in your demeanor and things like that, right? You can do that. That doesn't mean if they tell you to do something, you're going to do it. That's too totally... And you know what? You can respectfully decline also. Okay? This is wisdom, right? These things are, you know, being mature. Um, children should be uh, uh, instructed the same way. The same way. Now... The only exception to this is, like I mentioned, and there's, and there's a few of them, it depends on whether or not it's under your locality. 
So these would be the exceptions to that. If you go to a courthouse, let's say, um, you got to obey the people that own that place, that run that place. If you're going to go over, and I'm going to go into this in depth in just a minute, because it's very practical. If you go over and, and, and are visiting another person's house, you're at their house now. So you're going to have to follow their rules just like, your kids are going to have to follow their rules just like you are. Right? And you do so out of respect. It's not like you're putting up a fight and you're forcing you to do things you shouldn't be doing. You leave, right? And I'm going to go over how to behave in those situations. And another exception is the church. See, I'm the boss of the church. So I have rules in the church in just the same way that those rules apply to the adults, right? They apply to the kids. So if I make a rule that, hey, kids aren't allowed in that straw over there, you know, that rule applies because only because I'm the pastor here. Now, when I come to your house and start bossing your kids around at your house, and, hey, you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be that, obviously not, because I'm not the boss there. And I wouldn't even do it here when it gets outside of my scope of authority within your family and your rules that you set for your family, right? But within the, the, the scope of my authority within the church, okay, just like at your house, if I were to go to your house, I would obey the rules for your house. Uh, your kids would have to obey the rules that the pastor has, just like you would. If I said, hey, we do this this way, right? You know, obviously, uh, and, and, and everybody always wants to, you know, get up in arms about the pastor, you know, being, he's a dictator. Shut up. Gosh, I'm so sick of that kind of stuff. You can lead sternly and, 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 and uh, firmly and be loving and caring and sacrificing for other people. But I still make rules. Okay? And they need to be followed. And if I tell the kids not to do this, I tell the kids not to do that, those are the rules because I you know, govern this locality. This is my area of, of governance, you could say. Governance, right? Um, I'm not abusive in my rules. I'm very, very lenient. I feel that I'm extremely laid back and extremely lenient. And you know what? A lot of that I'm able to be more so now because the church is so small. I, I won't be able to... You know, I don't say anything. Like, a lot of times, like, Brother Hall, for example, if somebody busts in my door, you know, let's say his kids, he corrects his kids for it. I don't care as much. I will later down the road. You know why? Because there'll be, you know, 90 kids at the church. And that won't be able to happen. Every five minutes, a kid just feels like they can just come in. And I can't keep track of who's in there all the time. And I don't know if this is missing or that's missing. And if a child goes in there without, and everybody knows these rules, obviously a child can't go into my office without me being in there. I've always said that I don't allow that. But if a child just comes, you know, opens the door, I'm not real, it's not a big deal. I prefer for you to not, but I'm not, I'm, I'm very laid back about those types of things. So obviously that would be an exception. Now, the rules that I have for the kids here, if you were to see a child breaking one of those rules and it's not your child, you can wisely and discerningly remind them of the rule without telling them what to do. This is wisdom, right? You're having discernment right now. Hey, you know Pastor Baker says not to be in the straw. You're not supposed to be on that mound, guys. Remember that without just like ordering all the kids. You know? You know, I don't, I don't say anything to anybody like, hey, that's not really your area, and those aren't your children. And it's good that a lot of the kids here, a lot of the parents here oftentimes, you know what they say? They'll say, hey, you know, my kids especially get over here. Right? And I, I even do that when it's something that's outside of my locality. If I'm going out there to get the kids, sometimes I'll say it as a reminder of all the kids when I'm the pastor, so obviously I can't do that. Hey, kids, church is starting. You know, sometimes if it's just that I want in that case that I'm worried about my kids being out there, I'll come out there sometimes and say, hey, my kids inside. Make your kids now inside. Right? So understand what falls under your locality and don't boss other people's kids around. Parents don't like that. Right? You know, uh, uh, particularly, and here's another example. Let me, let me, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Here's another example. Um, there was a time at my job where I work now uh, where a father and a son both worked at my company. And they would both in many instances, uh, be on my job site, which I'm a senior lead technician. So that means I'm the, I'm the on-site overseer. I have a project manager, but I'm the boss on-site. So when they show up, they don't know what to do otherwise, you know, other than what I tell them to do. 
So I got a father and I have his son here. This is another area where this, where this works. If that father tries to tell his son to do something other than what I'm telling him to do, and it has to do with the work that we're doing there, I'm not going to allow that as the overseer. And he, and he was kind of a hard-headed person, and he struggled with that. And you would have to understand that if you're willing to have your son working there, right? Obviously, if I'm telling your son to do something that he shouldn't be doing or that you morally disagree with, then find a different job. That's totally different. I'd do the same thing. But if you don't like somebody bossing your son around, then I, what, how do you think they're ever going to work? Right? You better never work with them. And there was a couple of times in the beginning where I could tell he had to adjust to that. I'd tell him, like, and I had to pull him aside. Hey, I almost said the guy's name. I didn't want to do that. I purposely didn't want to say his name. I had to pull him aside and say, hey, man, I understand that's your son. I can under- and I understand that this is probably a difficult adjustment. This could be challenging. But when it comes to, I would never step out of line in this area, but when it comes to things that pertain to, in lieu of our work, in light of our work here, things are going to be done my way, not your way. All right? if, it, if it pertains to the work that's being done here, I'm the one that decides how it gets done because I'm the one that answers for this job. Because you're his father and you don't like him doing it that way, that doesn't fly because that's not the way that I do it and my stamp of approval goes on this and I'm the one that answers to the project manager. So your son and you and anybody else in my group, period, is going to do things the way that I would want it to do. That was a little bit, uh, you know, I work in construction industry, maybe a little bit more brash than that because it happened one time and I slightly corrected him and then I pulled him aside. So your kids, well, my point is this, your kids are going to have to uh, learn how to be under authority of other people eventually. And you need to teach them how to be under that authority, but the only time when that should happen is when it's someone's locality. It's an area where they rule over. And you yourself, you need to make sure if you're ever telling an other child what to do, and there's a way to do that, and I'm going to talk about that lastly here, you need to make sure that, you, that, it, that it, it falls under your uh, 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 territory, right? Your jurisdiction is the word that I was looking for. And it falls under your jurisdiction, okay? If a child's breaking your rules, I said, for example, you know, the kids are standing in the straw over there, be wise and just at least for sure make sure that your kids can't get out of the straw, okay? And then you can say, hey, kids, remember you're not allowed to be over there. You don't need to boss other people's kids around, and obviously you're not the pastor here. So understand how those things work. And obviously you can't create rules the same way, right? Okay, and, and one thing to keep in mind, Proverbs 17, 12, this is a, runs throughout the Bible. It says this, Let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his father. And what you learn from that is that when you mess with somebody else's kids, you'll make them very angry. Right? If somebody really harmed or hurt your kids, you'd be very mad. You'd be very angry, okay? So you need to be very, very careful. What we learn from that is you need to be very, very careful the way you speak to other people's kids, the way you treat other people's children, because the, you know, the person, the, the mother, or, you know, most of the time it would be the mother, but the father or the mother that is standing by and maybe sees you do that two to three times might get, and I've seen it happen with that particular person that I mentioned earlier, that was kind of a Karen boss of people's kids around and was very nasty and rude to people's children. Somebody put up with it two or three times, and then one time they said something to their kid, and I mean, that woman made the biggest fool out of that person that you'd ever seen. I mean, she, and it was the type of person that you would have never expected that they would have blown up like that in front of a lot of people while people were exiting church. And they just ripped them a new one. It made them look like a fool because they were guilty of something they shouldn't have been doing. Like, you are such a busybody and nosy, and you're talking to other people's kids, and you're nasty and mean, and everybody knows it, and I'm just the one saying it. It was a person that would have never have acted that way and said something like that. But do you know why they did that? Because it was their kid, and they were sick of it. The point is that, as we see throughout the Bible, where it talks about a bear robbed of her whelps. That means her babies, her child. You know, how angry that that bear gets. People get very offended. Just like you would get offended if somebody was mean or rude or nasty to your kids, other people do too. And you will turn somebody into a monster really quick and a bear really quickly if you mess with their kids. Right. So be very careful in the way you speak to other people's kids. Be more kind to other people's children than you are to your own. Right? Everyone knows that I am very careful about the way that I speak to people's children. 
Have you ever noticed the way that I talk to a child when I'm getting ready to correct them? I always say the same thing in the beginning. Hey, buddy, don't do that. Did anybody notice that? I have the same phrase. You know why? Because they're not my kids. And I want to be very careful that I'm not offending you. Right? Even if your kid's doing the same thing all the time. Exercise patience, be an adult. And somebody else's kid's doing that, you know what you say to them? Hey, bud, you know you're not supposed to be doing that. And I actually have the authority to correct kids here when they're doing things that I say that I don't want done here. I have the authority to say, hey, don't be doing that. You know, I'm still careful because that's maturity. That's wisdom. You need to be careful the way you speak to other people's kids. All right? Um, like I said, this is a huge block of text here, so it's hard for me to make my way through it. <clears throat> oh, going to other people's homes. I need to hurry because I've gone on for a long time here, but this is important. Uh, another a, 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 a d- domain of authority, someone else's home. When you go to other, when other people's houses, someone else's home, respect their rules. Mm-hmm. You agree to go, they have rules, respect their rules. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You'd like them to respect your rules, respect their rules. Mm-hmm. I'll give you a few ways in how to approach this. Make, and also with that, obviously in this context, make sure that your children are obeying the rules. And teach that to them when you're on your way there. Hey, they may not have the exact same rules as us, but we need to follow their rules when we get there. Need to be, you know, following their rules. Hey, we may not always take our shoes off when we go to when we go to our house, but let's make sure we take our shoes off when we get there. Okay? Or we, they may ask us to do this, or they may say this, or they may say that. So don't just do whatever we do at our house. Let's do what they want us to do at their house while we're there. Okay? You follow other people's rules when you go to their house. This is how to prevent. Some of this is how to prevent confrontations between other people. You get on somebody's bad side by just going to somebody's house and kind of being disrespectful at their house, and then they're just annoying with you. And then it's just a, you know, a, a snowball effect going forward. Mm-hmm. And this is a real thing in, in how to keep yourself safe from these things. All right? Um, don't, don't, uh, uh, well, here, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. I'm going to give advice to, to, to both, and I'll, I'll do it separately to make it organized. Um, as the owner, if you're the owner, people are coming to your house, number one, verbalize your rules. Be clear. Make sure people know your rules. That makes it easier on you and them. Verbalize them. You want people to take their shoes off. When they're coming through the door, you can tell them right then. Be discerning with all these things, too. There's no reason that you, you can't be discerning. You know what you say? Hey, everybody. Hey, guys. Because I'm from you know Cincinnati. It's more of a Midwestern thing. We say guys instead of y'all, if you've ever noticed that. Hey, guys. Brother Russell, you've noticed that before. Hey, guys. There's a shoe rack over there. Or, hey, the shoe rack's right in the garage. Uh, you know what I'd say? Uh, if anybody's ever come to my house, you've noticed it. We have a shoe rack now, so that's what I'm going to say now. But we, we usually say, hey, guys, you can throw your shoes in, in the garage. Instead of me, because I, I want to be careful. You're at my house, and I want things done a certain way, and we don't walk around with our shoes on. Nonetheless, I'm respecting the authority that you have in your household, too, with your kids. So I don't want to – you see how this, there's discerning, walking the line. You're knowing where to step and where not to step. Okay? So I present it as an option. More so, right? Obviously, I want you to take your shoes off, and I mean, if you walk in there, I'm going to say, hey, we want, you know, we don't walk in here with my shoes off. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm eliminating confrontation, though. And I'm saying it in a way as if I'm not forcing you. Because I don't want to have to. That's why, on the other side, for the person that's visiting, ask. Hey, you guys, that's a common thing that people really don't like. I'm not crazy about it. You know, we don't take our, we don't walk around with our shoes on. But I'm not like, we're not going to stone you to death if you forget to take your shoes off. But some people are, are, are very serious about it. And hey, that's their prerogative. It's not a big deal to me. Right? So just ask. That's a very, since you know it's a common thing, if you're going to somebody's house, a lot of people do this anyway. Do so we need to take your shoes off? You start to act like you're taking the shoe off, right? You know, you've seen people do that at your house probably before. Ask. Find out what the rules are. Is there anything that I need to tell my kids? When you get there, when you go to somebody's house, is there anything I need to tell my kids that you don't want them doing? And then you tell your kids. That's another point. So to the guests, all right? Ask about the rules. I got ahead of myself there. Um, ask about the rules, number one. And then you tell your kids. And if you see your kids doing something that, that you know that the owner said they didn't want to do it, you say something to them. Don't wait for the owner to have to say it. Mm-hmm. Who, when other, kids, other people's kids come over to our house and they're doing things that you don't want them doing. Who wants to correct somebody else's kid? 
Elliot does, apparently. <laughs> he raised his hand. I like to yell at him. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. Now, I don't want to have to tell your kids not to do that. So you tell them. You tell them. So I don't have to. Because you know me, I will if it gets to that, but I don't want to. Right? And you should do, you should have a much, you know, you should have enough backbone to be able to say, hey, we don't do that. Kind of. And discerning. Hey, buddy, you know, we don't do that in here. We don't do that there. We don't play with that. Another thing is this if you're having people over as the owner, if you remember this, this was one of the other rules that I said in, in how to make family rules for your household to begin with eliminate the temptation. Eliminate the temptation. You're preventing the potential of anything happening. When we have, when we know we have people coming over, we do preparations. We lock doors of rooms that we don't. You know, it's not, it's not good manners to have kids just wandering through houses. And who wants, who wants these rascals in your master bedroom? Right? Nobody. So what you do, you lock the door. If you go in there, you unlock it, and then when you leave, you lock it back again. You're preventing problems. Preventing. If there's something that maybe those kids could damage, you want to put it up. Because you know what? If they broke you know, your mother's vase that you've had for 40 years, you're going to be upset. Especially a woman would be... Women have, have usually struggle with resentment and things like that. Uh, it being bitter towards people about stuff. Put it up. If there's a possibility that something can get broken or whatever, put it up. We do things like that. We have people coming over and we make preparations for the people that are coming over. Yeah, obviously, you should do the same. Think that through. What, put things up that maybe people can get injured on. Whatever it may be, right? You cut it off at the roots. You don't have to deal with the problem later. You prevent the issue. If you see one of your kids doing something that the owner said don't do, you be the one to stop them. You know, if the owner, as mentioned earlier, if the owner, if you have to be the person to tell them you don't want them doing it, do it lovingly and kindly. Right? That, that basically equals this. Do it gently. Right? Do it gently. Uh, don't be a jerk to them. Don't be rude to them. Speak even more kindly and nicely to other people's children than you speak to yours. You're just being extra careful. You're being very, very careful. And all of this is, a lot of this is just preventing confrontation, preventing problems, stopping problems before they ever even happen. That's what a lot of this is. It's helping you to deal with how to, how, how to uh, uh, have interpersonal relationships in all sorts of situations and how to prevent confrontations and things like that. Uh, the, the also famous line is so powerful. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I'd rather prevent something. It's much more better to just prevent something from happening than having to fix it later after it's already happened. Okay. Um, problems with people's children and kids and fightings and things like that, those turn into big issues really, really quickly. Really fast, really quickly. So be very careful about the relationships that you have with other families, and especially the way that you treat other people's ch children. So summary of a lot of those points is, is this. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, don't overstep your bounds. Don't be rude or disrespectful to other people's children. Uh, 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 handle situations with, uh, with, in being unbiased as best as you can. Identify your bias. Know that you're biased. Try to work within your bias and take that into account. Um, handle situations with gentleness and kindness, just as you would your children, or even more more uh, 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 gentle and safe with other people's children. Try to tell somebody's parents first before you correct somebody's kid, unless it's an emergency and you're saving their life. So it, it, it'd be good. Hey, so I don't know if you let him. Right? See how I'm discerning with my words. I don't know if you let so and so do this, but he's doing this out there. You know what you might say? Yeah, we don't care. That's why you don't correct somebody's kids. Say, hey, don't do that. And their parent, their dad's like walking out at that moment. And he don't care whether they do that. Now I gotta tell my kid, hey, buddy, you can do that. You know, don't listen to what he said. You know, you're not gonna like that either, right? It's it's unnecessary. See how we're stop, we're preventing issues, we're preventing problems. These are inner, these are skills that you need to be able to get all and this, from a Christian perspective, all these things are biblical. Right? You can, you can find a biblical, biblical principle um, for all of this. If you have to tell a child not to be doing something, I cannot stress this anymore. It's so, so important. I cannot stress this enough of you. Say it kindly and gently. Speak to other, pe other people's children 
timely. Let's bow our heads and word pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, dear Lord. We thank you for um, all the wisdom that we can glean from the Bible, and we can put it together and create all these principles of how to live our life. We thank you for the power of your word. The wit, as I said, the wisdom of it cannot be stressed enough. Uh, we love you so much. We ask you that you would help us, and all of us here, to uh, desire to be the best parent that we can be, uh, that we can raise good, godly children and a good, godly seed um, that's not going to end with our, our children, but it can go on and they can receive the blessing for many generations to come. Uh, we love you so much. We ask you that you would uh, uh, bless every family here tonight, and that is to, to keep them safe and help them to walk in your word. We love you so much. Again, in Jesus' name, amen.